<clears throat> I don't know if, excuse me, anybody else in the room has ever been to Mayfield, but it's a truly small town. And when I was raised, it probably had the same population, but it seemed smaller because there wasn't anything to do. Um, <clears throat> when I came, I was raised in the Methodist church, but my grandparents, Kennedy, lived next door, and they were strong Southern Baptists, you know. And I went to church with them a lot, so I kind of had a mixture of being a Methodist and a Southern Baptist. I uh, went to public schools, and one reason was we didn't have any private schools. Uh, my parents, in that length, <clears throat> in that time frame, I don't think, particularly in, in the further south you went, Many parents were very affectionate to children. Mine weren't bad to you, but they just, you know, expected, you know, they're giving you food, shelter, and they're not going to brag on you too much because you might, you might really believe it. Um, <clears throat> my grandfather, Kennedy, was um, a person that came, he was born in the late 1800s and was a farmer a lot of his life until the Great Depression. They lost the farm. Uh, my grandmother got tuberculosis. They lost where they were living. And if relatives hadn't pitched in, they would have been some of the early street people. But he came back uh, in the real estate and building business, uh, and he did well. He uh, took the farm that our house was on and made that into a subdivision. They were big tithers before I'd ever heard the word tithe. They, they never thought about not giving 10% to the church. And one thing my grandfather Kennedy always said is always treat people so you can do business with them again. And I never forgot that. And, um, you know, he was one of the people that a handshake and an agreement was a signed contract. You didn't have that back then. And when I first started working on the road and selling, we still had some of that. You know, nowadays it's very rare and you have to watch what you agree to because it may not, you know, it's going to change a lot of times before the contract's over. My father was, uh, after World War II, he came back and tried to get in the grocery store business. That didn't work out too well, and he went to work for a, a ball clay company down there in the office. Didn't pay very well, but there was a lot of people looking for jobs after World War II, so he was kind of fortunate. And my grandfather finally got him to get his real estate license, and the main thing, my father hated the real estate business, but my grandfather cut him in on a lot of deals where life was better for us with having my grandparents there. In later years, my father did all right down there, but it, you know, he, he had very few benefits. He didn't really, you know, understand a lot of the people were retiring with big pensions and all that. But... He was very involved with his work. He loved committee work. He was on every committee at the church. He was on civic commit committees, and uh, he didn't like sports particularly until he took up golf in his late 40s. We would hunt together maybe twice a year. One of the uh, turning points in my life was when I was 16, we were in Louisville at... I think a key club convention, but I don't even really remember, but that's the first time I ever had alcohol to drink. And, you know, we didn't get drunk, we were smarter than that, but it kind of made you more relaxed. And being in a small town that was dry county, we didn't get to partake of alcohol very often, but then in 67 I came to Lexington to go to UK and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was about five hours away from my parents. Um, 
Lexington, UK was a big party school, and I did manage to stay in. A lot of people in the dorm didn't. And then I joined a fraternity, and the house, I don't know if any of y'all remember the six pack over there, the six brick dorms like. Ours was on the end, and it made the one in Animal House look like a top flight place. I mean, we had windows broken out. It was, you know, it was bad, but it was a lot of fun. And after three years, I got called to active duty in the Army for about six months. And my pay in the Army at that point in time was $120 a month. They would give you six $20 bills. And I mean, I can understand what poor people go through because now I was living in the barracks, but I mean, you just didn't have any money as a trainee in the Army. Um, I left, when I came back, I needed to go to work, so I left UK without a diploma. When I finally finished up, it took me 16 years to get a four-year degree. And uh, I remember going to the dean of the business school, and I said, you know, I really need to get my diploma. And he started looking, well, a lot of the requirements that I had been under didn't still exist. And he kept looking and looking and looking, and he finally wrote down on a piece of paper about five courses, five or six. He said, if you take these and pass, I'll give you a diploma. So I did, it took a couple years, but I got that done. And um, I told my children, I said, y'all are not gonna be under the 16 year plan. <laughs> you, get, you get four years, I'll pay for after that. I mean, my parents didn't pay for all 16 years, but I said, after that, you're on your own. No graduate school, no nothing, because by the time you get out of med school, I'll probably be too, too old for you to even care for. But um, after I got out of, well, I hadn't even graduated from college, I went to work on the road traveling. I had a company car. I had an expense account. Um, I worked out of my home, so I didn't have a boss right over me. I worked, but then in all this time period, my drinking was progressing. And it, it didn't get horrible for a period of time, but every year I was always drinking more, more things centered around alcohol. And finally, when I was 30 years old, I was down in West Kentucky at my parents' house, and I'd been drinking a lot for a few days, and my father went to see a doctor that went to our church, and my parents were really not very sympathetic or knowledgeable about people that had addictions. You know, they thought it was weak-willed people. And they told me that plenty of times, that the only problem I had was that I didn't have a backbone and that, you know, I needed to get it together. But this doctor was in AA. I knew him. I didn't know him very well. But he came by and took me to a meeting, Dr. Dillard, in Paducah. Because Mayfield was so small a town, I don't even know if they had one meeting a week back in those days. And this guy changed my life just listening to him talk. He was a cardiologist. Uh, he, I didn't know, I had no idea that he had a problem drinking because he came to church every Sunday. And I think his wife did too, and she came to church. But anyhow, he got me started on the way to approach arresting the disease of alcoholism and living a good, happy life. And that was in 1979 in December. And I had been in several other jobs before I got that. One of them was in the leaf tobacco business. And 
I was with a friend of mine the other night. We had worked together and gone to college together, and we started talking about all the people in the tobacco business, and most of them were dead. A lot of them drank themselves to death. Because, I mean, that was a that was a very strange business to be into when you were going to the different markets and you were in a town that had no restaurant open at night. If you didn't eat a big lunch, you didn't get anything else to eat. Uh, I'd been in the retail jewelry business. Uh, when I started, I started going to AA at the Bell House here in town, if anybody remembers where that is. That was the Lexington um, headquarters of AA, and they had meetings every night, every day. And I started going there, and it was a great experience. I'm sure that saved my life because you met so many different people, and a lot of them you only saw one time. They never came back. You never knew what happened to them. But it made an impression on me. And it showed me, and, and a lot of them, it was mainly, I don't think I went to any men's group, went to a lot of co-ed groups. And everybody has a different perspective. I think that you, for me, you don't want a, a group in AA, I don't know if anybody here that's in one, it doesn't matter, that you only hear one type of recovery or something. And we had people there that had been sober from 35, 40 years down to one day. And I went there for a lot of years. And then finally I changed jobs. And I was traveling a lot here, in the, you know, all over the United States, down in Mexico some. And I quit going to meetings for several years because I was never in town, and I went to out-of-town meetings, but I don't know, that just didn't work for me too well, but I never forgot what I was trying to do, and that was stay sober today. And that, um, that helped me because then, a few years ago, a good friend of mine, we'd worked together at the company I was still with, he had been fired for drinking. And he was off work for a while, and he got a job with company that had a plant here in Lexington and he called me and we got together and had lunch and then he mentioned a meeting on Tuesday nights that he goes to or he went to and I started back and that's been a lot of help to me because went through the pandemic a lot of things you know all of our uh, parents dying problems with children a lot of stuff, and that has always kept me going because any time I get in a bad spot, I think I've just got to get through today, and that has been a real help to me, and I think that uh, it has helped me in other parts of my life a lot. As Tim said, after I quit uh, working or after I retired, I had a bad, I recovered now from, I finally got the surgery like five years later. I should have had four, but I didn't. And I started volunteering with a lot of groups I never would have thought I'd have been part of. You know, we do some work with the Catholic Action Center here in town, uh, volunteer down here at the food pantry and the community closet, and then the one that I enjoy most is a low-cost spay and neuter clinic in Versailles, and um, down there every Friday all day. I did learn one thing that, for me, you know, they came to me, I'd been down there a year or so, and said, we'd like for you to serve on the board. And I thought about it, I should have run out the door, but I didn't. And um, so I was on the board, and that wasn't too bad. And then the vice president retired from it. And the president, who was the only one we'd ever had up until that time, she said, well, I need you to be vice president. I said, I don't want to get into that. She said, oh, you don't have to do anything. Just if I can't be at a board meeting, you chair it. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah. Well, a few months later, she called me, and she said, I'm resigning from being president and on the board, too. And I said, why are you doing this to me? And she said, oh, you'll handle it, no problem. Well, 
I mean, it's it's been an experience. Um, I learned that, you know, you don't handle volunteers like you handle employees because volunteers can leave at any time. So you have to, you know, I think I'm pretty easy to get along with, but you know, I'm sure some people don't. I'm sure if you ask Gail, she would start laughing hysterically if, I, if she thought that I was telling people I was easy to get along with. But it's, it's been a lot of, uh, I've learned a lot of things. Uh, we never turn animals away if they can't pay. We do it, they get everything. And we've been blessed with a lot of sponsors and a lot of people that donate. But I'm still there. Uh, many times at a board meeting, I ask them, why won't you impeach me so I can, so I can have a normal life? You know, they said, no, no, you hadn't suffered enough. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel that way some days. <laughs> but anyhow, it's, uh, but I use all those principles of one day at a time, it's going to get better. Uh, don't worry about it down there. I mean, I'm surprised that I'm not, you know, reading a, a Bible in another language trying to come up with something. But life has become good for me. It's not perfect, but I just think a lot of days, particularly if I'm by myself or whatever, about how I started because I missed a lot of things. Thankfully, we never had children until I had already been sober for four or five years. And I mean, it wasn't planned, but it's just the way it worked out. It worked out better. I was glad that um, my grandparents, Kennedy, had already passed away when I started because I think it would have really killed them to know it. And uh, I don't know if they thought I was going to be a preacher or not, but probably a a first helper just preacher somewhere and it it's like anything else you can be in the bottom of the barrel and there's a lot of people with you so you don't think it's odd you know I didn't used to think it was odd to go to a bar at seven o'clock in the morning and have a few drinks because there was other people in there with me and now I don't criticize them but I know that's not how I want to live and um, I think that um, I look at people now with all kinds of um, issues, be it physical or one thing that happened a few years ago, I got Bell's palsy for anybody that's been in here and had that, and I look like I'd had a massive stroke. And I have all the empathy in the world now for people who have physical uh, issues, particularly ones that you can see, because people look at you, kids would look at you and kind of point, and, um, or look at me and point, and I've, lear I've learned a lot of tolerance. Um, the big thing I have learned is spirituality. Um, AA is certainly not a church or a cult or anything like that, but it, it teaches you you have to believe in a higher power, I believe in God, so it wasn't hard for me to get that. But it's not, you know, it's not an organized type of program. Everything they do is suggestions. They probably have a better cure rate or, or arrest the disease rate than anybody. But nobody is told they have to do anything. This is a suggestion if you want to get sober. And I kind of use that in a lot of parts of my life. I'm very glad to um, be where I am. I never thought that I would have stayed in Lexington my whole life, but we have, and it's, you know, it's been good to us. My wife's happy. We have two grandkids. They live in Louisville. Uh, one thing that's good about grandchildren, you can always take them home. And uh, we love them dearly, but there's times they need, we had them last weekend, all weekend, and on coming back from Louisville Sunday night, I said, man, I'm glad it's over and Gail said, I am too. <laughs> um, but anyhow, well, I want to thank you, thank David for asking me to speak this morning. Uh, it's been a long time since I'd spoken to any kind of group. Um, 
One time I was asked to speak out at the federal penitentiary to their AA group, and a great bunch of people. You know, I don't know if they thought that I'd been sent out there because I'd probably end up there next or what, but it was, uh, they, were, they were very good people, and they all admitted they should be where they were because they had broken the law. And um, I wish the best for all of them that were there. There's no way I could keep up with them, but it was, it was a good experience. There's well a lot of other things. And um, with that, I thank you and have a good day. Thank you, John, and thank, thank you for the service you provided this church. I, I think it's interesting in light of what he just told us about himself that his son-in-law is a brewmaster. <laughs>